Welcome everybody, I'm Steele Wagstaff. This is the uh, August Pressbooks product meeting. Um, we'll cover some new features that we've released that you may want to know about. We'll give you an update on some of our big development projects, especially the Pressbooks directory, which is nearing completion. And we'll talk about a couple of things that network managers can do to get their network books ready for public display when the directory goes live. Um, we'll give a little bit of an update on what's been happening with the LTI Advantage or results for LMS, as we call it. And we'll leave some time at the end for community roundtable for any of you to share news, projects, other things of interest for the rest of the user community. So thanks everyone for being here. And I will start by just sharing a couple of things that we have done recently at Pressbooks that may be of interest for you. One of them was, I can't really demo it very well, um, but uh, if you're using our LTI provider plugin, whether it's 1.1 or 1.3, we have made a change to how the user roles get assigned. So I'll give you an example of a Pressbooks network and show you this, what the setting looks like. Pressbooks settings are set, you'll see globally um, at the network level, you can decide based on the LMS role, what role a user gets mapped to. So if I'm an LMS administrator and I launch a Pressbooks book via LTI, I would have the role of whatever Pressbooks role I want to give them. If I'm a staff member, meaning a faculty or an instructor or a TA, what role would I get upon LTI launch? And then a learner, what role do they get? Usually the defaults are all just set to subscriber and that's the global defaults. But at the book level, you can change it. So if you are a professor and you are teaching a course and you have an LTI link to a Pressbook and you want students to be provisioned with say, the author role in the book or the editor role, because you're collaboratively writing a book for your class, you can do that using the LTI settings. We had had a, a problem previously where if a user was created for the first time upon LTI launch, it was always automatically making them a subscriber. It wasn't respecting the settings. So we fixed and changed and deployed that. So now whatever settings you set at the book level, they'll be respected whether the user already has an account or whether the user is newly created. So you can use this feature with confidence knowing that the role provisioning will happen as intended. So that was a recent fix that's been pushed and deployed to all production networks. If you're using the old LTI or the new LTI tool, you should see uh, this, the same or similar behavior there. So the next thing that we were doing was we've added for all uh, links in a book in the XHTML. So the, the XHTML that's used to make the PDF, we added an additional attribute to all of those links, which includes the full path of the URL. That attribute is called data URL. And the way that you can use it is in your custom CSS, for example, PDF, you can decide like, for example, in the print book after an, uh, a link using the pseudo element after print out the content of this data URL attribute. So here is a specific example where the, the book that Aperva was just showing you, they wanted to be able to display the actual link references in the print book after every link. So they added a little bit of custom CSS to their PDF print export. And then you see the, sub, the resulting PDF um, will say this book has this. So this is a link right here. And here's the printed value of the link displayed in the book. The same thing would happen in the footnotes. So, so that, that, that's available and it can be targeted and used with CSS. It just helps if you want to print your full, the full path of URLs in the print book. And Aperva and the folks at Rebus have been the people who requested it and have made the first use of it. So that's now available there in Pressbooks. Um, and we also made a couple of changes and improved the performance of a third party plugin called Lord of the Files. This is mainly used by network managers, but by default, we have a pretty strict allow list and block list for what kinds of files can be uploaded to Pressbooks. Pressbooks isn't meant to be a file server, but it can handle some media files. And Lord of the Files also lets you um, sanitize and check file uploads to make sure that they are what they say they are. If you wanted to use it um, uh, at the network level, if you're a network manager, but it'll be network activated if you host with us. So here in this particular case, you'll see uh, tools, debug file validation. If you're an administrator network manager, you'll be able to upload a test file and debug it and see 
is this file allowed to be uploaded? Is it what it says it is? So for example, I'm gonna pick a PNG. I'm gonna upload it and it's gonna tell me, okay, we validated this file. This was a screenshot of PNG. It says it was a PNG, it actually is a PNG. We tested it and it tells me, you should be able to upload this file. If it's not working, you've got a problem. So sometimes you may wanna upload a file or a file type and test whether it's permitted or allowed. If I were to try to upload a SVG, for example, that would need some stricter validation. Um, this also means that there are additional file type extensions if you need to be able to upload specific file types for a book. So we recently worked with someone who is uploading some sheet music files created by an open source musical notation program. They wanted to be able to allow those type of files on their networks. Network managers can email Pressbooks premium support and we can add certain file types to your allow list and this tool, uh, Lord of the Files, will help validate and test them. Um, we are also working on a couple of pretty exciting things that haven't been released, but will be released soon. I'll give you a sneak preview of them. In Pressbooks, we have had for a long time, or for a little while, a cool feature called Shapeshifter that's available in Malala. So if you go into your theme and you apply the Malala theme, and you come to theme options, you'll see that this shapeshifter feature allows you to select a different typeface for all of your headers. So you can choose any one of these many typefaces for the header and a different typeface for the body font. You can do that for the web book. You can also do it separately for the PDF and for the ebook. So you can really choose your preferred type font pairings with Malala. It really lets you kind of modify and customize this theme. Up until now, Malala has been the only theme that this is available for. We've added a couple of new typefaces to this list. One of them you'll notice is Source Sans Pro is relatively recent. I can't remember who requested it, but it may be on this call. We also have recently added Source Mill Goody, which is a serif font that some people like the look of, but that was somebody in Oregon who requested that. And we're adding a new font called New Athena Unicode. This is developed by a, a a classics organization and it has really good support for a bunch of ancient Greek, Coptic, a bunch of ancient languages. So if you're working in a project that has non-traditional scripts and don't want to declare them in a different way, you can choose to display this new Athena Unicode. Um, and that was something that you, uh, the user at UC Berkeley had requested. They have a huge Greek manuscript and really wanted to be able to use this typeface. It has an open license, so we we're able to add that. That will be coming soon. The other kind of exciting thing is that Previously, Shapeshifter was only available in Malala, but people like the feature and wanted to be able to use it elsewhere. So we have turned it on and we'll be turning it on soon for McLuhan, which is the main core Pressbooks theme. In the near future, when you use McLuhan, you will also see these font selector options for McLuhan. We're considering doing it for other themes as well. If this is important for you, you like the feature and want to be able to use it in your favorite theme, you can let us know and we'll make the decision to start releasing this and other themes as needed or as requested. But that's a little bit about what's coming soon for theme options. Another uh, pretty important change for a small group of users is you can see that we provide language and script support. So this feature is pretty cool because it allows you to declare support for any number of languages which have different alphabets or different scripts. When you select the language, we will download the typeface that's needed to display those characters and make sure that it's used as the fallback. Up until now, it's previously been other language sets. So we recently added a couple of Western African alphabets, Adlam and Nako. But one of the new ones that's brand new to us is called musical notation. So in, if you're writing music, there's a whole bunch of Unicode characters, which are not typically represented in many conventional typefaces. We have learned from our friends at SUNY that there is an open source, a really nice open source musical notation font called Bravura Text. Uh, it's used for musical notation and it's using this standard music font layout and it's an openly licensed font. And so now if you want to have Bravura Text supported in your books and have the fallback for those Unicode characters, you would simply need to add mus musical notation in the language and script support. And then those Unicode characters will have a fallback that's represented in your web book and all of your exports. So that should be cool. Uh, I don't know that much about musical notation, so I can't really demonstrate it professionally, but I know that there are people and users that are really um, excited about this feature and we're uh, hoping to include it in our next release uh, on Wednesday.
So that's a little bit about what's coming with some additional typeface and language support. It's really fun learning about um, the many different ways people represent language and other symbols. And it's been a growth experience for me personally, so I've enjoyed working on that. And hopefully this will help meet the needs of more of our users who want to publish more diverse kinds of content. Rama, I'm glad that you appreciate Nico. I just learned about it myself and the Adlam as well. It's pretty exciting. Um, yeah, that's we, actually my dialect, and I am surprised <laughs> that it's, uh, it's actually there. So they've made a pro like a long progress to get it there. So that's pretty impressive that uh, Pressbook now has that. Like, I can't wait to share that information with some linguists that I know. <laughs> terrific. Yeah, we have a, Hugh has a friend, uh, Florence, uh, who runs the Science of the Commune uh, Pressbooks okay. Network. And they're doing a lot uh, of work publishing Francophone African literature and just literature in any African languages trying to, I, I think she calls it epistemic justice or something. Like yeah. She's got a term for it. So nice. Yeah. yeah. So great. Yeah. We'd love to see more books in Nicole, Rama, even if I can't read them. <laughs> and th was that just a surprise, Rama, that, that we've added that? Yeah, it was a surprise, but I think it's also, I know that um, it's been, it's sort of been like in the development for a while. So it was actually surprising to see because it's not often that, you know, I see it or even know it <laughs> about, or like many people know about it. So I definitely have to do a little bit more research on the development of Inco and how, it's, and you know, it's progression since the last time I've learned about the actual written form version of it because I come from a Francophone country and that is my first dialect, but I learned French instead of that because we didn't really have the written system set up for school yet. Very impressive. Yeah, that's, that's super cool that you're on the call while fields and out from that. So yeah, fun. Makes me happy. Me too. I'm glad to have a user who was able to appreciate it because um, sometimes you do these things and you don't know who it's going to affect. So but thanks for much. If you visit staging.pressbooks.directory, you'll see a work in progress. We're gonna be working on cleaning this up and improving it, but you'll see the directories here, the search filter, the search feature is still available. Um, we've added a couple of refinements here to the filters. So you can now notice that you can choose to include any filter, or you can also choose to exclude a filter. So I think Amy had asked about this a while back, she's not on the call anymore, but suppose I don't wanna see any all rights reserved books. I can choose to exclude that filter, and it will show me all of the books which have any one of these open licenses. So it's a quicker way to get to what you're looking at there. Um, the filtering behavior uh, is both include and exclude now for all of the binary filters that appear in the directory. Another thing that we've done is we've added uh, the ability to change the number of books you display per page, whether it's 10, 20, or 50. And we've also given you a couple of sort options. This was requested. So the default sorting will be alphabetical, title A to Z, but you can also choose to sort by word count and by how recently a book was updated. Not all of the books have this metadata in the directory yet, so we're gonna be improving it and making sure that the book cards have that information. But those are a couple of new sorting features. We also have added the pagination at the top as well as the bottom. So there's a couple of places that you can look for pagination to move through results. Um, you'll look at the book cards and when they have very long descriptions, we're also gonna truncate the descriptions after six lines so that they don't make the cards keep flowing and look super enormous. And we're gradually cleaning up and refining the directory. Um, one of the big changes that people had requested was to have more granular control about whether a public book appears in the public directory or not. We heard that, that was really important to us. And so you'll notice now in Pressbooks, uh, if you go to an individual book, so here's a sample book and I will pick a book that's public. I have a public book. Typically this book, because it's public, would appear in the directory. But now every public book, if you go to settings, sharing and privacy, you'll see an option, whether you want the book to be listed in the directory or not. So the default value would be yes, public books are in the public directory, but you can toggle it and say no, exclude this book from the directory. So you can choose to opt in or opt out from the directory for public books. Private books will never be included no matter what, but this is a toggle that you can turn on or off for the public books in your directory. 
Um, we will be working this sprint to make sure that the directory applies that behavior. So even though you can choose the setting now, the behavior won't be applied immediately, but we, we will be applying it quite soon. And it will definitely be in place before we release the full public directory. Uh, I know that was a feature that was requested so that individual authors could have a public book that's still a work in progress. They don't wanna list it in the directory yet. They can choose at any point to change that setting and the setting should be instantaneous or close to instantaneous once it's finished. The other option is for network managers. So at the network manager level, uh, you will see under network options, at the very bottom here, book directory option. A network manager can choose to exclude any non-cataloged public books from their directory. The network managers, of course, if you remember, you have the ability to decide which of your books are in your catalog or not. So if you're using the catalog and you have a bunch of books in your catalog, you can say, I only want the books that are in my catalog to show up in the directory. That's a little bit more of a drastic step and it does remove agency from authors because generally you're the only person who decides what goes in the catalog or not. We would recommend in most cases that you not do that unless you're really sure that's what you want to do. But some of you have networks where that makes sense, where you're very tightly controlling the publication process and you only want your catalog books to be in the directory. So that's an option or a feature that's available there. So JR, the, the, if, if that setting is chosen, um, then only catalog books will appear in the directory. I think, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, if I choose to exclude the non-catalog public books, I believe that we take the choice away even from the yeah, if, the, if you've chosen that at the network level, the book, individual book authors don't even see that setting because it's irrelevant to them at that point. So that's how that works. If, if the global setting is on, the setting is not available at the book level. But if we go back to the global setting here and we were to say, oh, we want to give individual authors the choice, then the individual authors will then see at the book level under settings, sharing, and privacy, they'll see their toggle to be able to choose whether or not they want it in the directory. So, so those are the two new things that are coming. Obviously, um, you can start to make those adjustments and those changes now as you like, but you won't see the changes appearing instantly in the staging directory quite yet. That will be coming. Uh, we're working on that this sprint. It's one of our goals. So that'll probably be there by mid-September, and we'll give you an all update. You can also expect, if you're a network manager on a hosted Pressbooks network, you can expect an email from me in the near future explaining all of this in more detail and giving you some options and making some recommendations to help get your metadata ready for public view. So that's a little bit about the directory. That's what I wanted to show. Um, there's probably a few more tweaks and features that I forgot about, but just know that we're hard at work at that. And our goal really, our major goal of our next sprint over the next two weeks is to get the directory cleaned up and ready for closer to ready for public release. So, yes, so thank you, Lillian and Purva, Kathy. There's a question about what the name of the uh, open source musical notation typeface was. It's called Bravura Text. There's this organization called Smoofle. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but the Bravura Text was designed by Daniel Spreadbury, who seems to be a big person in open musical notation. That's great. Thank you for showing that. So that's smoofle.org.fonts. You can read more about Bravura. Steele, I have a question about the display order of cloned books. So I know one thing that struck uh, me when I was testing on the directory was that there are a lot of copies of the same book on different networks. So is there a way you can sort maybe by the original book and then list all of the other cloned copies to follow? Yeah, that was something that we, we, we did make a change behind the scenes of Purva. So um, we can control the, dis, the, the default display order and we did not, what we, what I did was it's alphabetical and then in a tiebreaker, it will be original book before clones. Now, that was a setting that had not been in place when you asked about it privately a couple weeks ago. So we now turn that on. So it should be whenever there's a, a tie in alphabetical name, it will try to display the original before its children. Um, and if you notice, I think the staging should be updated there. If we notice some, some kinks or some problems with that, let us know and we can keep working on that and tweaking that behind the scenes. But we would prefer to display the original before the children. 
Um, another thing that you can do is if that's kind of uh, feeling frustrating, you can always try to use the is original is a clone filtered. So you could weed out, I don't want any of the derivatives. I only want books that are in their database as original. Hopefully that's working a little bit better. And if you notice that it's not, let me know and we can take a closer look. Okay, so the next thing I wanna show is um, we have been updating our, our LTI plugin. We, we have a, a new product that allows you to use the newest standard of LTI and exchange grades and performance in a book between the press books with HIP activities and your learning management system. It's called Outcomes for LMS, or I'm sorry, Results for LMS, um, and Pressbooks supports this LTI 1.3 standard. So it's an additional add-on that some networks are starting to purchase and starting to use for their courses to do a bit more of the courseware type thing. Many of you have seen demos of it. Some of you are installing it and using it. I just want to let everybody know that if you are interested in using it or if you've begun configuring it, we've published in our network manager guide, we're publishing documentation for how to configure it with your LMS. So there's instructions for how to configure with Canvas. This is for the LMS administrator, so this is a little bit technical. There's instructions for Blackboard. There are instructions for Moodle. And then there's a demo video with instructions for D2L. We're still working on Sakai. We have some things that we need to work out with the Sakai maintainers. Um, and then it shows you how you can allow grade reporting in individual books as a network manager if this plugin is active on your network. So this would be a decision a network manager would make to either allow grade reporting in a book or to allow it globally. Uh, and then there's some instructions, if you have this turned on, how an instructor could turn a Pressbooks chapter into a graded activity. So it describes you add the H5P activities. There's a little screenshots and descriptions for how to get it ready as a graded activity. And finally, how you would add the graded activity to your LMS and make sure that the grades are being exchanged. So this documentation is there. It's the first cut of it. We've been working with people who are doing it in live production environments. And so there's a couple of things we're cleaning up and improving to make the documentation clearer, but just wanted everyone to know that that's there and available if you are using that tool or product. So that's a little bit about what's happening in the um, LTI courseware kind of space. Okay, so the last 10 minutes, uh, as always, this is community roundtable time. Uh, I'm gonna open up the floor to any of you. If you have news or projects or things that you wanted to share that are related to Pressbooks or Pressbooks development or just open publishing your campus, time is yours. I'd love to hear from you. Rebus recently um, supported the publication of um, this collection called Open at the Margins. I've just dropped a link to it in the chat. It's a wonderful collection of very informal works, blog posts, articles, lectures, talks by um, 43 different diverse authors um, edited by a fantastic group of uh, open education advocates. So that's something that we uh, were really proud of earlier this month. Um, and I hope that some of you will take some time to browse through and read. Thanks, hey. That looks great. I can't remember if I mentioned this at our last meeting, but um, we recently had um, a Pressbooks book that was co-created with students um, at UW um, in Rick Bonus's Critical Philippinex American Histories class um, featured on the Open Education Network. And there's an article that I just shared kind of talking about the book and how we worked with Professor Rick Bonus and um, students in his class on Thanks, Lauren. That looks like a really exciting project as well. I have a, a project that happened on our network and I have nothing, I'm not personally responsible for it or involved at all, but I just think it's really cool. Uh, we have had some faculty members completely like unfunded and unprompted and unsupported creating a medical terminology foundation text. Um, and I, one of the things I think is really amazing about it is, um, that every chapter has like pronunciation flashcards on how to pron pronounce like different anatomy and physiology uh, terms. It's one of the biggest grassroots projects that has happened in Ontario across like six or seven institutions. And I'll drop a, a link in the chat. I'm just super, super proud of, of, of these guys. They've worked really hard to make this happen despite people just saying, use a commercial textbook. <laughs> We recently just released um, the electronic version of a music theory text. It is the text that Steele so kindly helped us and how we discovered Brevera text together from my faculty member who's really on the up and up for these sorts of things. 
So we just have the online Pressbook version available right now and um, we'll be having the PDF later this month. Um, but it's really, the author put so much work into it um, and it's really very, uh, very detailed, lots of multimedia resources in there. So um, yeah, hope, hope people find it useful. Thanks, Allison. I had a chance to look at this one a bit more closely than most of the books that get published, and it blew my mind. It's just an incredible, I mean, it is an, it's huge, and it's really, really an incredible, impressive work by this person, and it's so exciting to see that it's openly licensed. So well done to you and to Andre and everybody who worked on it. Tim, you want to tell us about this enormous Scolia project that's going on at Berkeley? Uh, that one's kind of been blowing my mind a little bit, too. <laughs> yeah, Professor, uh, this one of the professors here, Donald Vastrana, is doing, uh, well, he's, he's trying to archive a huge Greek scolia project that he's been working on for years, I think. Um, and that's what Seal was mentioning, providing the additional font support for that in press books so that we can get it into uh, various forms for people to look at, archive it, get it into our catalog, get it into the open textbook network. So. He's been just plugging along and thanks to Steele and the Pressbook support for helping like get this additional feature going. So we're excited about it. <laughs> yeah, this one's been pretty exciting to me. It's like a multi-thousand page Scolia edition of Euripides. So, I mean, if you're interested in the ancient Greek uh, drama, this is where it's at. And it's something this faculty member seems to have been working on for decades. And it's been a pretty quick transition into Pressbooks, which has been really gratifying. And he looks like he's nearly finished with that. And when it's published, mm -hmm. I'm sure everyone will, be, will have a link to share. But it's a bit niche in its audience, but very impressive in its scope. Elaine, if you're here, um, I know that this was going through the rounds recently, but I don't think it was ever announced on this call. There is a, a very impressive film studies book that was published at the University of Arkansas. Um, do you want to say anything about that? Or do you have a, is there anything you want to share in the chat around that project? I hope I'm not stepping on any toes. I'll just share it with them, with everyone. It's called Moving Pictures, an Introduction to Cinema. It was a professor, uh, Russell Sharman there. And it's uh, one of the most impressive like film studies things that I'd seen. It's all openly licensed. And it's, again, kind of like that Andre Mount project, largely a one professor project with support, of course, from the libraries and the publishing folks there. Um, and I will drop the link in the chat. I think it's it's... It's pretty amazing. I was, I just, I came across my Vietnam, you know, you look at those new books when they come out and this one, it was like an hour later and I was like re realizing I was still reading it, still looking, I was like, I want them to take a quick look and it just definitely sucked me in. It was, it was great. Okay. Um, does anyone have any uh, questions or product things that they'd like to talk about? I can stop the recording now.